And I'm like, like deer in the headlights, you know. Here I am up here in northern Michigan doing this interview on the phone with him. I can't tell him, you know, well, it's at the corner of Joe's Mobile, you know, in Levering, Michigan. <laughs> and so I start saying, well, uh, yeah, you can get it at, uh, you know, Borders and, you know, B. Dalton and Walden Books. And these are, you know, when they were before they were gone. And, uh, and my wife is in the kitchen looking at me and she turns and she's like, and she are mouths, she's like, what are you saying? And I'm like, I'm just kind of like, what do I do? You know, we are sitting down to dinner an hour later and the phone rings and it's Borders Hor Corporate Headquarters in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hey, mm. what do we have to do to get a case of those audiobooks? And that's how things really got rolling. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan, where we talk to ordinary Michiganders who are doing some pretty extraordinary things. I am your host, Cliff Duvinois. If Michigan is the home of cryptids, then I would have to say where I'm at right now would probably be their living room. And, uh, I really don't even have to introduce today's guest because every time I've been around Michigan and I've told people who I'm going to be interviewing, their mouths drop open, their eyes Google like crazy because everybody seems to know who he is. But I want to take him on anyways and just uh, introduce him to the show because it's really a great honor to have him here. You probably know him because of the Michigan Chiller series that is out there that he has written under his pen name of Jonathan Rand. So with that being said, <laughs> I'm going to introduce... Jonathan Rand to the show, i.e. Christopher Todd Wright. There you go. How you doing? Good. How are you? Really good. Excellent. Really good. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and where you grew up? Yeah. I um, was born in Pontiac. Uh, I grew up in Waterford Township until my fourth grade year of school and moved to uh, Grayling, which was at the time we'd been, we'd been kind of visiting. We had some property on the Osable River. So uh, on the weekends, we would come north and... Uh, I got in, I mean, at a very early age, I got into fly fishing and just, and I love being outdoors and I love for, you know, being out in the woods. And I just, uh, even from my, even my at kindergarten is first grade. I was very well aware of the conservation field. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to get a job working in the conservation field or, okay. you know, as a veterinarian or something. So when my, my parents said, you know, Hey, how, you know, would you like to move to Grayling? I was like, Oh my gosh, this would be a dream come true. And we came home from uh, one of our trips on the weekend, and there was a sold sign on the real. And I just I had the elation of that, like going, "Oh my gosh, this is a dream come true!" So I started. So it was between my fourth and fifth grade years of elementary school was when um, we moved, and um, it was just like a magical time because just exploring the woods like I'd never been able to do before um, for longer periods of time, and then uh, I just really fell in love with uh, you know the northern lifestyle and. Started going to college, and um, uh, that was a pretty tough week, of course. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, did not really apply myself. Um, but uh, but that's really the interesting thing about growing up is, and I look back on it now, is how much reading and writing played such a pivotal role. Yes, um, because yeah, and I, you know, I wasn't the kind of kid that you know parents had to send, you know, say, okay, you got to read a half an hour tonight or whatever. It's like I was the kid that. You know, the parents, I thought I was getting away with something because I was hiding books under my pillow with a flashlight. And then, of course, you know, you find out years later that my parents were like, yeah, we knew you were doing that. And then, um, <laughs> but that's what that was me. And I would scare myself silly with these stories. And I would think, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. I can't go to sleep. I'm never doing this again. And then I'd be right back in the library, you know, the next day, finding the new, some kind of a scary book. And, and, uh, and that actually, the, the reading and the writing aspect, um, you know, I didn't really apply myself as much as I should have in high school. And I certainly didn't in, in college. But when it came to getting a job, that's when it really helped out. Because um, I, I went to this local FM radio station. And I kept bugging the guy's name was Bob Greenwood. And I kept bugging him over and over, you know, for this job. And uh, I'd never been on the radio before. didn't know anything about the equipment. But I could read well and I could write well. And that's what they needed. They needed somebody who could make these radio commercials and um, and that's kind of where everything got started because with these radio commercials, um, I would listen to ones that I'd hear on the radio and I think, well, these are kind of boring and there's never much to them. So I would create these crazy stories, you know, like a Bigfoot going into a bank and opening up a checking account. And, right. And I had just, it was so much fun. It was so satisfying to do that. Plus, um, it also worked in the way for the advertisers because their commercials were getting attention. 
So they knew that people were hearing their commercials and it was, they were getting results. And, and I made a pretty good career of that before I actually even started writing books. So. Well, let's take, a, let's take a couple steps back here and unpack a couple things. Because I know you said that you got into writing. What was it that attracted you to write in the first place versus just you know reading or going outside and playing yeah. baseball for that matter? What was it about writing in particular? Well, I think you know I think where I get ideas when I, and that's a question I think most authors get is where do you get your ideas and and, and I th- and the answer for me has always been I get them from you know I get them from reading other people's books and it doesn't mean that I. I, I would copy somebody's idea, but I would read a book and I would get, I think, oh man, I could write a story about this or somebody should write a story about this. And um, I did, actually, I should, I, one of my first, very first stories, I fell in love with, um, there was a series of books by Beverly Cleary, uh, the Henry Huggins character. And so I was writing these Henry Huggins like fan fiction when I was in first grade and I just had like little short stories, but I would combine my interests at the time with the Henry Huggins character. And they were just, you know, they were just little, uh, you know, page long or two page long stories. But it was really fun for me to project myself and because I, I felt like it was me in that story. And I never forgot that. I always felt like when I was reading, I was there. I was sharing that experience with that character. And then I realized, you know, I could create that experience for that character who happens to be me. And it was, it was great fun being in elementary school writing stories about you know, Martian invasions and interplanetary <laughs> travel because I was the guy that was blasting off into space. I never separated that. It was just something, it was an exercise in imagination and creativity, but, you know, I didn't really see it for that at the time. I just, it was just fun. And what would you say sparked your interest in, I'm just going to lump this into sci-fi as all together. Cause now you're talking about blasting off into space. Yeah. You mentioned Bigfoot earlier. Where did this interest come from? Um, I think up until my middle school years, I was reading pretty much anything and everything. Um, I, I felt there were several books that I, I loved. I loved a, a book called The Phantom Toll Booth by um, Norton Juster, um, James and the Giant Peach by Road Dahl, um, Char- uh, a uh, book called My Side of the Mountain by Gene Craighead George. But in sixth grade, um, I want to say I think it was Mrs. Latimer read a story out loud in sixth grade. I was called all Summer in a Day by, and it was by Ray Bradbury, a short story. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was one of those that just, it hit me at the end of that story. That story just hit me with like a two by four. And I was afraid to look around because I know I had, you know, tears in my eyes and I didn't want anybody to see them. And I looked around and I saw that there were other students that had these, the same thing. And so I went rushing up to the library, Grayling Middle School is the library up the top in this old building. And I started looking for more short stories by Ray Bradbury. And I come across like this whole shelf of novels. I mean, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Which Dan- gave me goosebumps. Oh, I know. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Dandelion. I just stood there looking at this shelf in Fahrenheit 451. And then there's other short stories, you know, R is for Rocket and The Illustrated Man. I was like, oh my, my gosh. And that's when I started, and Ray Bradbury kind of, um, led me to, um, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and yes. some of the real great iconic, you know, Isaac Asimov, Heinlein, Silverberg, and a lot of these great sci-fi authors. So, so I, I developed an appreciation for that as, you know, as well as, you know, I'd always loved the scary type stuff and the Alfred Hitchcock had like the three, in, All the three investigators. investigators and yes. yeah, I you know, love that. Series. Yeah, it was great. It was really cool. And the Hardy Boys too, mysteries. Mm-hmm. So I was, yes. I was reading lots of different things and and um, so it wasn't really just just um, you know the, the the horror aspect of it. There was a this, this amalgamation of all different types of of reading genres that influenced me growing up. Wow, that is incredible. We could spend the next hour just talking about that. <laughs> I can tell that right there. Okay, so we've we've covered your passion for writing, getting out there, why you've gone into why you've gone into cryptids, and and you said that. You're working for the radio station, writing commercials. Yeah. At what point did you decide to make that leap from being in radio to actually start focusing on becoming a published author? Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know if I actually, that was almost, there was a transitional period because it was in 1995 and I had, um, 
I had read a book, and uh, it's a little cabin um, way off in the I mean, 11 miles out in the woods, living like a king in a little cabin. I had a white shepherd mix dog and, and uh, doing these commercials in a little tiny home studio. This is before MP3 and internet really right. it, it would, had come on. So I had to record these commercials on a quarter inch uh, stereo tape, and I was driving them over to the airport in Pelston, Michigan. Um, to meet the, because I was always missing the FedEx deadline. So I'd have to take it like directly to the FedEx office. And <laughs> I was always calling Chuck on the phone, you know, the pilot, like, hey, don't leave, man. I got stuff coming your way. And uh, I, 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 I read a book. I was, at, I was sitting down by the f- uh, fireplace in my living room and I read a book and I literally, I got done with it and I threw it over by the wood pile. And I was like, you know, if that guy can write a book and get it published, I can be, I, I can do this. And and I I think it's important to point out I didn't have it wasn't like an arrogant sense like I knew what I was doing because I'd never you know written a book before right but I just felt like you know I've get the I got these ideas and I keep thinking about them and I keep thinking about them and I I don't do anything about them I'm going to I'm going to sit down and I'm going to try and write a book and um and I then I realized that something happened too it was Edgar Rice Burroughs did the exact same thing in 1910 or something like that when he was working as a copy editor for a magazine. He had read some stories and he's like, gee, I could do that type thing. And so I embarked on, you know, this journey of writing. My first adult fiction novel um, was, it was called The uh, the Laurentian Channel. It was about a kind of a shipwreck, dive, murder mystery in the Straits of Mackinac. And it took me a while. I was picked up by a publisher. While I watched from the sidelines kind of what was going on, I was finding out more about the publishing world and the publishing industry. Um, and again, at the time, this was really before the internet. I mean, it was, yes. there was a little bit there, but you couldn't just go out and Google something like you can now. You really didn't have that kind of knowledge. You had to do some digging. But from what I could see, I was like, man, this is, I just didn't really care. I, I got a bad taste for the publishing industry before my book was even published. And I was right. like, I kept thinking, you know, I could do this better than these guys. Um, and so what I wound up doing was I, 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 I pitched this audio book about a haunted lighthouse and I pitched it to a number of publishers and most of them said, you know, I mean, we're not going to do this because Pass. yeah, we're going to, you know, you know, yeah, sure. You got your own recording studio. Wink, wink. Yeah, sure. You, you know, they didn't realize the, the <laughs> scope of what I was doing, but then I put myself in their position thinking, you know, here's this guy in Northern Michigan calling them from this little, you know, little cabin. What, you know, what would, what, you know, would I expect? So. I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it myself. So I did. I recorded it. It was a three-hour story I wrote. It was uh, called St. Helene. It's a haunted lighthouse story about the island west of the Mackinac Bridge. I finished the story. And uh, it was funny because my wife and I had gone into a, a restaurant called The Boathouse in Sheboygan. And it was kind of like this, I don't know, a, a minor celebration of just finishing the audio tran- book or the audio version of the, of the, the text for writing it. I hadn't recorded it. And I met a guy there by the name of Eric Berkey, and he was the bartender. And uh, we'd known him, before, we'd known him, uh, we'd, but we got talking that night. And he said, "Well, uh, my dad has a boat down at the marina. Have you ever been to Saint Helene?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, you'll meet me down there tomorrow. We'll go." And so we drive. Uh, we got, and I immediately, immediately, I, I got, I knew I picked the wrong slip. <laughs> because I, we drive and it's my wife and I and we have a, a little cooler, a cooler lunch and we're looking at, and I'm looking at the slip number and I'm looking at this boat and I'm going, this is not the right place because it's like a 40 foot cigarette boat. And I'm like, this is, wow. no, this is the wrong, this is the wrong place. And, uh, and uh, it was the right one. And so we got, we took this for this huge, I think it was 40 foot, I'm not maybe exaggerating, but, but it was a big, I mean, big boat. Cigarette boat. Like it was, got a good footprint. looked like yeah. it was 80 feet long. We took this thing across the Straits of Mackinac all the way over to St. Helene Island. We took a dinghy in and spent the, and it was in, it was the most, it was, it was all, it was bone chilling to me because what I had written about was almost identical of what we encountered on the island. I mean, it was like I had been there before. And here was this story about the Borders family and their encounters with, you know, supernatural entities on the island. And, um, of course, we didn't have any of that happen to us, but as far as like the layout of the island, some trails, I mean, like it was really spooky about how that had, uh, you know, it, it, I had written about that. So we took all kinds of pictures. I used one of them, gave it to a graphics artist, and he wound up actually using it for um, the cover of the audiobook, which I solely produced the whole thing. I wrote it, music, sound effects, 
did everything, put it on cassette tape. Remember nice. those? Yes. And uh, it was two cassettes, and we sold it for twenty nine dollars and ninety five cents. And um, and I took it into some of the local bookstores, which were very kind. You know, they were very nice and they were very polite. But one of them was like, "Hey, where's your ISBN?" And I'm like, "What's an ISBN?" I didn't know. I had no idea. And they said, "Well, it's an international standard book number." And I'm like, "I didn't know what it was." And they said, "Well, you, you know, you have to have one of these pretty much to." to have the you know to have these sold um but the thing occurred to me at the time was that i had this audio book and even though we, uh, f- only a few people my friends and and such had had listened to it at the time and th- but they really were very kind they thought it was they really liked it and i thought well i mean i'm going to have a hard time selling this if i don't if i can get this in a few bookstores that's great but there's only you know a couple of bookstores up here and I, so i started thinking about you know, you're thinking, you know, Northern Michigan, we've got this big, huge tourist base. You know, people come from all over the world. Yes. Um, they, they don't come here to go to bookstores, really. I mean, we got a couple great ones, but that's not their prime, you know, motivation right. to come here. But they do have to eat, they do have to sleep, and they do have to put gas in their car. So that's what I thought. I thought, okay, restaurants, hotels, and gas stations. And my wife and I hit the road, and we just went around to... Everywhere, a gas station, restaurant, or a hotel. And I wouldn't take no for an answer. I was just like, I would finally, if, if, I, if a, a store owner didn't want to buy these and then resell them, I would say, look, I tell you what, I'm going to leave you five of them and I'm going to come back in two weeks. And if you haven't sold any, I'll take them and I'll give you one for free for your trouble. And it worked great because it got me out of their face. <laughs> it was, I was done. <laughs> huh? and, but it was, it was like literally within a couple of days, all of a sudden the phone said, our home phone. It's like, hey, we're out of them uh, audiobooks you just dropped off. And, and all, next thing you know, we've got our own little... Dis- Sometimes seeing is believing. Dis- yeah, yeah. So it worked out pretty cool. And that's really kind of how it got started. Everything really kind of... It started when... when um, the thing that really uh, took things up to a next level is, is uh, we, we, the audiobook was given to a friend of ours um, by the name of Mike Ridley. And I, well, I, I gave it to him. He, was drive- he drives all around. He's an entertainer. And he listened to it and he really enjoyed it. So he gave it to a friend of his who at that point was working in Detroit radio. His name was Ken Cal, Ken Calvert. And uh, and I think he was on WJR at the time. Right. And I get this phone call and it's Ken Calvert's producer. And he says, hey, Ken, really listen to your audio book. He really enjoyed it. He wants to interview you. And I'm like, oh man, that'd be great. Here we go. So I get interviewed and I'm doing this great interview and he's very gracious with his time. It's five, I get five minutes on, on this radio station. Huge, I mean, millions of people listening. And, um, and he does a great job. He's talking about it and uh, consummate professional and he gets right to the end and he says, okay, he says, we got to go, but tell our listeners where they can get this great audio book. And I'm like, like deer in the headlights, you know, here I am up here in Northern Michigan doing this interview on the phone with him. I can't tell him, you know, well, it's at the corner of Joe's Mobile, uh, you know, in Levering, Michigan. <laughs> and so I start saying, well, uh, yeah, you can get it at, uh, you know, Borders and, you know, B. Dalton and Walden Books. And these are, you know, when they were before they were gone. And uh, and my wife is in the kitchen looking at me and she turns and she's like, and she are mouths, you crazy? she's like, what are you saying? And I'm like, I'm just kind of like, what do I do? You know, we are sitting down to dinner an hour later and the phone rings and it's Borders Har- corporate headquarters in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hey, mm. what do we have to do to get a case of those audiobooks? And that's how things really got rolling. So, oh my goodness, yeah. I love yeah. that story yeah. all the way around. Yeah. So let's go back. I want to I want to unpack a couple things, but before we do that, we really do need to take a break and uh, thank our sponsors. But when we come back, I want to explore that story a little bit more and sure. even how you got into doing Michigan Chillers. Yeah, cool. We'll be back after the break. Hey, if you are enjoying these great interviews, just take a moment and go to TotalMichigan.com slash join, and you can get these episodes sent directly to your inbox, because there's a lot more great stories coming. See you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan. I'm your host, Cliff Dubinois. Today, we are talking with Christopher Todd Wright, a.k.a. Jonathan Rand, about uh, his awesome adventures in the world of publishing, which I didn't think could be exciting, but this is actually really cool. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. So uh, Chris, before the break, uh, you were sharing with us about how you kind of put B. Dalton and all these other bookstores on the spot yeah. to carry yeah. your book. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take a step back here because you're self-published now. Mm-hmm. So 
before you were saying that your book was actually picked up by a publisher. Yeah. But the audio book, you did that on your own. I did. So would you say that that your experience with the audio book is really what made you kind of lean into going the self-publishing route? I, yeah, for sure. Because what happened is is when I when I signed the contract with my first book, um, I scribbled out on the contract. I scribbled out audio rights. I did not want to give any audio rights to the publisher at all, and they they had no problem with that because at the time they weren't involved in audio at all. So um, so it worked good for me because I wanted to make sure at the time I was already doing a lot of audio work, um, uh, mostly like radio commercials, obviously, and, and uh, some some for. F- some work for film, but mostly primarily radio and, and television. The um, the audio, St. Helene, when that one came along, I thought, okay, now I've got this. I, I, can, I can produce this. I don't know anything about putting a book together, but I can put together this long story. Um, and it really was. Everything that about it was done essentially by me. Now, I did form a corporation, Audiocraft Publishing, 1997. That was formed um, just for, you know, taxes and, and you know, logistics um, and such. Um, so it's, when you say self-published, it is true. It's, it's self-published, but it's under the umbrella. It's under the corporation name, so which still exists um, today. So when, when St. Helene came out, it was, it was published under, um, under Audiocraft Publishing, but it was available only as audio and only on cassette. And I had a number of um, of people ask bookstores would would say at the end of the summer, you know, that it sold quite a few books, but they said that you know a lot of people picked up the audio and they were intrigued, but they wondered if there was a novel, if there was a a book. For Ooh, it. there you go. So I was like, well, you know, no, there's not. But at the time, but at, during one of my, uh, I went up to it was oh, actually I do remember it was this the Hessel Boat Show in Cedarville, Michigan. I okay. went up there for a, for an audio book signing, and I met a guy by the name of David Gurney, real creative, um, incredible guy, and he had published a, a book on his own, and I was just mystified. I'm like, how'd you do this? <laughs> And, and he said, "Well, I did it in Word Perfect, and I did this, and you oh, know, Word I mean, Perfect, yeah, oh my yeah, we're in a way back machine. I know." And uh, uh, and he said, "Yeah, he said you can you can format all this, you know, do all the margins and everything." And I was, this is a like totally new to me. Is I was completely mystified that you could and amazed that you could do this. So, long story short, and the, my you know the whole learning curve of getting it all done, I wound up actually in nineteen uh, summer of nineteen ninety eight was when the audio book came out. Summer of 1999, I published St. Helene as a novel. Um, and then within literally within weeks, I published another novel called Ferocity, which is about a giant muscalunge, 12 foot muscalunge that lives in Mullet Lake and eats people. I mean, it's just like a freshwater jaws, Should but it was have fun. Eat people. It, was so, it was so much fun to write. It was just a <laughs> riot to write. And yeah. it, I mean, it freaked me out because, you know, you see these muscalunges, well, not very often when you're when, mostly Northern Pike, but I used to scuba dive and you know, snorkel and you'd come across some of these northern pikes sometime and they get pretty big and they're, yes. they're they seem pretty menacing underwater and you're like oh my gosh those things look like monsters so i created this monster story called ferocity and i created a fictitious town called corville c-o-u-r-v-i-l-l-e and i thought i want to create a metaphor if you took everything about northern michigan you know, the clean air and the fresh water and the beautiful scenery and the forest and the woods, and you put it into a bottle and you sold it as a beverage, what would you call it? Well, I came up with this list and what I settled on for the book in the, and it's it published in the book is a Courville cooler. But one of the names that I came up with was a Michigan chiller. Ooh, and, here we go. And that name hung with me all that summer. I was like, Michigan chiller, you know, I told my wife, I said, you know, it almost sounds like a, a series of, you know, of kids' books, you know, and and, uh, and I started thinking, you know, I could write stories about different places in Michigan, and you know, and kids that are from the area, you know, they they would, you know, they would be kind of, I'm sure they'd enjoy reading about their places, or, or kids that visited, it would be fun for them to read too. So I thought, well, I'll do that. I'll read, I'll I'll try one and see what happens. And I thought, well, May, Mackinac Island is a popular place, big tourist destination, and. Uh, so I came up with mayhem on Mackinac Island, and just the whole process was an absolute riot. I had so much fun, you know, writing that story, even though it was different from Saint Helene and Ferocity, which at the time I was busy still kind of working marketing those. Um, and then uh, Mayhem on Mackinac Island came out in March of the year two thousand, and immediately what happened was within 
the next month or two, um, I mean, you know, remember my distribution network was relatively small at the time. Right. So parents would come in, they'd go to a gas station or kids would be there and they would pick up Mayhem and Mackinac Island autographed copy and they would read it. And at the end of the book, and I, which is it's very synonymous with all the books that I write in the Michigan and the American Chillers, the main characters, they have the, conf- the, the you know, this climax and resolution and they solve the big problem. And then they wind up meeting another character from what will be the next book. And that main character says, well, you know, you, I know you had a pretty incredible experience on Mackinac Island, but wait till you hear about what happened to me in Traverse City. And this main character begins the conversation and the reader gets the first two or three chapters of the next book at the end of like Mayhem and Mackinac Island has the first couple chapters of Terror Stocks, Traverse City. So they read that. And then Billy has just read the book. He's back at his home in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And he's like, I got to have this next book. So mom and dad drive him to Barnes and Noble or whatever their bookstore is. And all of a sudden, you know, they, 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 in essence, what it wound up doing was making bookstores find, seek me out. Because I had sent out like 300 copies of Mayhem and Mackinac Island and got zero response. Nobody, nobody replied to them at right. all. Nobody was interested. And even those, I, you know, I, I, when I called in most cases, Northern Michigan, I, it, was, it was a pretty much a shoe in because it was a book about Northern Michigan. But downstate, it was a, it was a little more of a challenge. And uh, so I, it, it, all of a sudden, we get a call from a distributor. They want one case of Mayhem on Mackinac Island. And it's like 56 books. I'm like, oh my God, I'm on my way. You know, this is, this is great. You know, and then, I mean, then two years well, later. Well, just getting the phone call. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah, on a fax. We get a fax order. You know, here's our fax number. And I'm, and I'm like, oh my God, we get a fax. And then we get this fax order that comes through. And then, and then you know, a year later, we're shipping them, you know, semis, loads of books, you know, which is kind of cool. So, well, let's go back because I want to, yeah. I want to unpack a couple things there. So, you you start off and you write mayhem on Mackinac Island, mm-hmm. okay, and then and then you said really what I thought was ingenious. So I read the Dog Man of Drummond Island, mm-hmm. and just like you said, you get to the end of the book and you and you it kind of weaves into the next book where you give out uh, the the I guess the first couple chapters yeah. of like you yep, said the following is. book. Yeah. Where did that idea come from? And I say that because I've I, I've read eleven gabillion books. I haven't seen that in a book before. Where did that idea come from? I think, you know, like all good d- ideas, it's it's borrowed or stolen, one of the two. Oh, um, well, okay. It, no, really, it is. I don't I don't claim that. Uh, what I think happened with that, I think it's a unique idea, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a brought from several different because I remember there's several adult fiction books that I read that have like samples, sample chapters yes. of other books. And um, I remember, I think Goosebumps had sample chapters in their books. Oh, yes, and yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, and there's other, um, you know, children's books, young adult books that have like similar, that were similar to that. Um, and so I think a lot of it did come from from that. But I wanted something, I wanted, see, I, had, I try to have cliffhangers at the end of all the chapters. There's like yes, a really hard cliffhanger, like something immediately is going to happen. You know, Susie is falling out of the tree into the jaws of a giant polar bear. End of chapter. Well, some, I mean, what is going to happen? You've got to figure out the solution for, you know, Susie. She's either going to be, her fall is going to be broken by another branch or something is going to happen and she's not going to be eaten because there's only half of the book left. Or there might be like a soft cliffhanger, which is more like some kind of just a foreshadowing type thing. I wanted to do that at the end of my books so that, Yes, there was a resolution, but I wanted to leave a little bit more. And, you know, so it's like, okay, well, if you like this, try this here too and see what you think. And that's what I did with Mayhem and Mackinac Island. They meet, you know, Matt from, um, you know, the next, from Traverse City. And he tells them all about the, you know, this, this giant snow beast. And, and you get the first three, four chapters and you're left with a cliffhanger of this, you know, this monster. So, And I, I do want to go back and talk about that as well. The, the, the fact that you base your books on geography, right? So it's mayhem on Mackinac Island. It's yeah. the dogman of Drummond, Drummond Island, right? Yeah. You're, you're very specific about the location mm-hmm. versus trying to be as vague as possible. Yeah. Right. Which for me, reading the dogman of Drum, Drummond Island gave it a very concrete place 
very yeah. small place for the story to take take place. Yeah. Where did the idea come from to focus on just, you know, for that initial book, Mackinac Island, and then the next book, Traverse City, where did the idea come to, to focus on that? I think for the, for the first six books, if you take a look at them, all of them are based in Northern Michigan. Mm -hmm. There's Traverse City, Poltergeist of Petoskey, Aliens Attack, Alpina, Gargoyles of Gaylord, and Strange Spirits of St. Ignace. Those cities are ones that I was really well familiar, familiar with and had traveled to quite a bit. So I was able to, you know, when kids read those books, they're, they're not history lessons. I don't really, there's not much, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not putting stuff in there. Yeah, you yeah. know, you might get a little bit, you might have some landmarks and things, but for the most part, it's really story. You know, I'm really working on the story. Um, but then as I began to speak at schools and libraries and travel a little bit more, yeah, I wasn't not uh, unfamiliar with like Kalamazoo, but I hadn't really spent a lot of time there. Well, now, next thing you know, I'm visiting schools in Kalamazoo and the, in the Detroit area and Saginaw. So I'm able to kind of start, you know, just the idea of coming up with these titles was a riot. You know, dinosaurs destroy Detroit. How could you not write a story about that? You know, right. it's like, oh my gosh, there's so many different story ideas. And then with um, Dogman, um, we had a, a summer writing camp for a number of years and I would always tell a Dogman story. Michigan Dogman, obviously very, very well-known story. So I would come up with my own Dogman story at these campfire when we have these uh, uh the author quest camps um and so far i finally i thought well if i write a dogman story i need a d i need a d place in michigan and somewhere and i thought well dearborn but that's close to detroit and i like dowagiac and then when drummond island hit i thought oh my gosh because i went to drummond island to stay for two weeks to just kind of hide away and write a book i did that back in 2009 or 2008 and I thought, Drummond Island, you know, it's this really, I mean, there's, it's a huge island, right. not very many people. What a great place to have a dog man creature. So <laughs> that's kind of how it works. So there really isn't any huge rhyme or reason to it. It's just kind of what, you know, it, uh, it, it hits my fancy at the time. Your Michigan Chillers book just, it goes gangbusters, right? It's, it's popular. Mm -hmm. You're selling them. You are churning, you're, you are prolific. How many books have you published now? Um, about 140 right now. Sweet Moses. Yeah. I know yeah. people that struggle just to get three out yeah. the door. <laughs> so you've done 140. That is amazing. At some point in time, you jumped over and started creating American chillers. Yeah. Like venturing outside of Michigan. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Well, I had, when I started the Michigan chillers, even before I, uh, I was still at the time thinking, may, you know, this is a really cool idea. Maybe I could get a, a publisher involved. Um, so I did, I did reach out to some publishers and, um, I had one of the largest ones in the world at the time, you know, I did get a response back from someone there and said, you know, this is an interesting idea, but kids aren't reading books like this anymore. And, you know, it was too, oh, too, too specialized and too localized. And I, and I said, well, um, and I did write back and I said, I, you know, if the Michigan chillers are, is popular, I could expand, I could do American chillers or world chillers and, and, uh, never heard anything back from them mm. um and of course like two years later after i'd sold a couple million copies they were like hey how come you're not returning our calls but uh, uh but what happened with that was you know it was in the back of my mind to i thought you know i could expand this on american children's but at the t in the summer of 2000 i was having so much fun you know i was you know i was traveling i was doing these book signings and you know i had five or six books out um, just that first or, yeah five yeah five books out four books out for that summer and it was so it was just so much fun at the time that the American Chillers was kind of just off in the distance. But I started getting letters in the mail from kids and they were saying the same thing. Hey, have you thought about writing American Chillers? You could write about this state and you could write about this state. Or, and I live in Illinois. Why don't you write about this? And right. so I'm like, you know, these kids, I mean, they're on the same wavelength. So it was um, in December of 2001 um, where we had the premiere of the first book in the American Chillers. We did that in, at the Royal Oak public library. Uh, I think it was December 12, 2001. And um, it was from Mich Michigan Mega Monsters. And at that point, I put the series on hold, uh, Michigan Chiller series on hold to get a few books out in the American Chiller series. And, um, and another, another book called The Adventure Club. The first one was called Ghost yes. in the Graveyard. That one came out. Um, and so I had those, those, those three prongs going at the time. And uh, wasn't sure exactly where it was going to go, but uh, I knew I was having a great time. So. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah.
And then, so you're, you're writing books primarily geared towards kids, teens. Mm -hmm. And at some point you made the leap to get into more adults. Yeah. Horror, adult thrillers. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Well, I'd started, you know, I'd had, I'd had some regional success with uh, St. Helene and Ferocity uh, and a book called The The Laurentian Channel, which at the time had not, was not published. Um, But I, there was a, a situation that happened where, and I wish this was, I wish this would happen more often. I mean, it just doesn't happen enough. I woke up in the middle of the night with the, the seed, the idea of a story. And I have no idea where it came from. It was something, whether it was from a dream or what, I have no idea. But, um, and I was going to write it down. I started jotting it down on a piece of paper and I thought, ah, to heck with it. And I just flopped open my laptop and I wound up literally scripting the entire book um, in this half asleep state, I guess, um, closing my laptop and, uh, and that was it. I went back to sleep and that was, was bestseller. But the problem I had was, I mean, I was really excited about the story. Problem I had was I was just, I was busy. I was traveling. I was, you know, doing all this. We didn't have a store or even if you have chiller mania at the time. I just, but I had a business manager and my wife was doing all kinds of things. I had another friend who was working for me doing tech stuff. And, um, I thought, I, I'm just not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna have time to, to write this. So I went up into the Upper Peninsula, which is where the story takes place anyway, and just kind of locked myself away in this cabin for two weeks and, and literally fleshed out the entire book at the, at the same time. And that was in the summer of, it was quite a while ago. That was in the summer of 2001 because I was just finishing up um, the edited manuscript of Mackinac City Mummies, and I took my I took my printer. This is this is how and this is how what I had done at the time. I had taken my printer because uh, I wasn't sending my stuff off via PDF at the time. It was just I sent it off as text to this book printer, and they would take that text and make the book from my text. So I sent. The manuscript from um, May, or excuse me, Mackinac City Mummies, uh, just printed it up on my printer from this cabin in the woods. Drove it to the post office in Wetmore, Michigan, which is just outside of Munising, and mailed it to the to the printer. And that's how that how that got started, or that was <laughs> how that book was was printed. But during that time, the fun thing about doing that was number one, I was um, back in the middle of the woods and essentially. There's the the story that I wrote on in that on that laptop. Everything unfolded around me, and the backdrop, the atmosphere of where I was, became that story, and the story became the atmosphere, and just meshed together. And there were times where I was, and I mentioned this too, um, is it because um, I don't believe in writer's block. I don't believe there's any such thing. I think it's something, that, and I think Terry Pratchett made has said. He said, writer's block is for people from California who, you know, <laughs> who can't write. And I'm very, very, I, I, I believe that so very much because we all can write. You know, you can, you, is, you know, is there anybody that can't spell cat? You know, I mean, you can write. Just what it is, is we get into this level of judgment where we think that what we're writing is not good. And I got news for you. Probably, it's probably not. Most of what I write is not good. 90% of it is garbage. But the important thing is to continue writing until you get to those gems, until you get to those pieces, or not be afraid to, to edit it out. That happened a lot while I was there, but I persisted and got things done so that after two weeks, I had this really, you know, a good, solid boilerplate of a, of a story. It took a little while to actually kind of flesh it out again a little bit more and certainly get it done, but, uh, but that's how Bestseller came about. So bestseller is a story yeah. about an author mm-hmm. seeking a publisher. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm not going to spoil it for the audience, yeah. but uh, it is a tad bit of a thriller. And I couldn't help but to notice in there when I was reading that there was a lot of passages in there about being obsessed with finding an agent. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, was, I had to wonder if maybe there was a little bit of you you know, in that story on your journey. And you know what people, and I, you know, that's a question that I've heard before because they think it's like, are, is this part of this guy? Is he really? And, and I would have to say that there is to an extent, but what I did with the character in that story is I thought, what if 
this character has those frustrations, which I did, and I think all authors do have the frustrations with their agent or their publisher, or or they will if they're you know if they're going to be um, assigned by an agent or a publisher. Those are very real frustrations. But what if somebody just really took it to the an extreme, extreme that was really just out there? And what would he what would he do, and how would he go about it? And that's essentially what it was. And I I align myself more with um, I think more with the the the, uh, the protagonist Anne Harper in the fact that you know she's a she's a savvy businesswoman and she's in the business for the right reasons. You know she she realizes that you know in order for this to work we all have to work and you know there's no corners that we cut. It all you know it has to work. She's a straight shooter and an honest player. And I kind of align myself with, I feel more like that way. That's the way it, it should work. It doesn't work that way in a lot of cases. Sure. But, um, and that's obviously the blowback that our, you know, antagonist was feeling in the story and just thought he was going to, uh, thought he was going to have his way with uh, what he wanted at any cost. So, nice. Yeah. yeah. And a couple of things that I want to, uh, we're getting ready to draw this interview to a close. Why don't you talk to the audience about your latest writing? Because Michigan Chillers yeah. and American Chillers is Jonathan Rand. Yeah. Your bestseller, your adult stuff is under Christopher, Christopher Knight. Knight. Yeah. But yeah. you've actually gone through and meditative writing for yeah. our audience yeah. out there. And we'll make sure <laughs> yeah. you get a close-up shot of this. Meditative writing. Uh, talk to us. Talk to us about that. Yeah. In a nutshell, it's using um, uh, the blending of, of meditation and writing. Um, for not only, I mean, just just um, settling your mind, but then w one of the things that occurred to me is that I, when I started getting into meditation a number of years ago, it was great to be able to kind of sit down and just kind of settle things, you know, and, and allow your mind to kind of rest. But the problem that I've, I found over a period of time was that it's just going to get stirred up again. You know, you're, you're still going to stir all this stuff up. And so I, I did a lot of different experimenting in, in ways, and I mentioned in the book, it's kind of like, it's like uh, you know, taking out the trash or, or getting rid of it. But the, but the truth is, is that you won't, and you never will, because life happens, everything comes at you. You can't control a lot of things that happen in your life, um, but you, get, you can control how you deal with them. Right. And the way I have always done that, or should say at least a, a large portion of my adult life has been through writing, uh, and particular journaling. And you don't, you don't have to journal or, or, or keep a diary, but for me, that's been really, really instrumental in helping me creatively, um, helping me just kind of, just kind of see things in a very, in a, in a wider pantoscopic view. And, um, and I think it helps me as well as being, I mean, uh, uh, as far as I work on four or five books at a time in top of, of, of my, my journaling. That's amazing. Yeah. But it allows me to keep things into perspective, I think. And it's not, I don't present it, my med the meditative writing book is, um, there's some, there's guided meditations on there and I don't present it as like a cure all, um, type, uh, thing at all. But as far as dealing with anxiety, dealing with stress, um, and then what to do with it and how to proceed. Um, it's almost just a, a different life manual. Certainly. Yeah. And in addition to that, you're not done with your chiller series. No, no, not yes. at all. Not by far. So we've got American Chillers. Number 45. Yeah. Yes. The giant jack-o'-lantern of Georgia. Yeah. Yes. It's one of the new ones. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this. That one was a riot. That I just, I, I, I wrote it. it. It took a little while uh, longer to get out, but it's, uh, it's about a couple of kids, obviously down in, in Leesburg, Georgia and, a a, a uh, they meet, they're out digging for worms because they want to go sell them to a sporting goods store. And they've actually, well, they're going to have this little uh, business. And uh, <laughs> they, they, they come across the, this old woman, and her name is Hattie Broussard. And the Broussard family has been growing these pumpkins there for years, but they haven't in the past few years. And there's some kind of strange circumstances uh, surrounding that, but there's even more strange circumstances surrounding this one single pumpkin that seems to be growing in the field and it seems to be getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and then all of a sudden it's gone one day and a couple of weeks go by and then it's halloween and i will leave it at that Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun day it was a fun i had so much fun i mean i have fun writing all of them but that one in particular was one of those ones where it's just like oh i can't stop oh, i gotta keep my hair I love it. 
uh, Chris, if somebody's listening to this interview. They want to check you out because I know right now we're filming this in yeah. encrypted headquarters. Yeah, so to speak. yeah, it's Chiller Mania. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, if somebody wants to stop by, see you, get an autographed yeah. copy, check out your books, find yeah. you online, where can they do that? Yeah, well, there are uh, two things. Chiller Mania here in the summertime, we're open seven days a week. We'll be open, um, uh, uh, what is more of like weekends and throughout the fall and winter. We, we're here quite a bit because we do a lot of shipping, uh, but that's in Indian River just off I 75 uh, in Michigan or AmericanChillers.com. Um, we still ship a lot of um, of our retail orders through there. So, and and if you can, if you want to, you mean to personalize a book, I'm happy to do that. Usually, if sometimes it takes a couple of days longer, but uh, but yeah. So, AmericanChillers.com is a great place to to contact me. Awesome, Chris. Thank you so much for taking time thank uh, you. to chat with us today. Really appreciate it. Learned a lot, and uh, this has been a great interview. A lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Thank you. And for our audience, you can always go to TotalMichigan.com, click on Chris's interview and uh, get all the links that he mentioned above. We'll see you next week when we talk to another ordinary Michigander doing some pretty extraordinary things. We'll see you then.